you see the screens okay? Yeah. You got lots of pictures today, she won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> so you got the handout. Uh, you can see up there, my name's Trevor, I'm the general manager here. I love teaching our classes. Today is the one that I know if you came, uh, you're a hardcore gardener because you care about your yard. So um, This is always not the funnest class to teach, but but uh, certainly some useful information will hopefully get, get you ahead of the game. Um, I'm going to talk about some general tips, of some, some ways to prevent this in the first place, and then we'll have plenty of time. I'll show you kind of the most common things I see around here. You're more than welcome to ask me anything you like after class, too. So, so if we kind of talk about some general tips, uh, first and foremost with me is debris cleanup, and this is uh, one I struggle with. I'm kind of an OCD gardener. I don't like leaves out. I don't like debris sitting out. It's hard because the birds enjoy it, uh, the hummingbirds get protein out of there in the winter and there's a lot of reasons to leave some leaves. But what I would say is this, if you had a problem last year, specifically probably disease or insect for that matter, clean up that plant. Don't leave the leaves to mulch, don't let them compost at the base. We want to get that stuff out of there um, so that we don't have less chance of it getting right back on the following spring, if that makes sense. Um, a big one for me. You know, this, this side of the mountains, I don't need to tell you, we're wet, 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 and not as hot in the summer, um, although lately we have been getting nice summer weather, but I'm more worried about disease myself than I am insects in the, for the most part. Um, disease, you've got to get ahead here in spring, and there's ways like cleaning up debris. The second one there is air circulation. You know, if I want to prune my plant right, I get sun penetration, I get air moving through, Disease blows around in every bit of wind and rain we have in Washington. So right now as we speak today, there's little spores blowing out in the wind and landing on our plants. They're not going to have a chance to take a foothold or propagate unless our foliage is wet for about four hours. Then it has a chance to attach itself and start the process. So the more we can do to keep things dry, get air, get sun, get all that stuff moving through there, we're going to have a little better chance of, of fighting disease in the first place. Um, like always the right plant in the right place, you know, not to pick on a rose, but if I plant a rose in shade, what's going to happen? You know, I'm going to get powdery mildew because it just doesn't get enough sun, it's going to struggle. So getting the right plant in the right place will, will be a huge help. Uh, this time of year, drainage is always an interesting discussion because a lot of people come in March, April, May, you know, this plant crashed, this one's turning brown, what's going on? A lot of that goes back three, four, five months ago to where we probably had some issues with too much water on the roots, didn't quite drain well enough. Um, kind of the right plant in the right place again. There's some things that will take more clay or wetter conditions in the winter. There's other plants that won't do that at all. So we just got to make sure we get the right one there. Um, like I said about the disease cycle, you know, this goes back to some other things. The next one, overhead watering, it goes on and on, but the, the best I can do to keep my things dry, I'm going to have a better luck of not having some problems in the first place. So I avoid all overhead watering. I mean, I run a sprinkler, but that's in the summer. We do it in the morning, so the sun dries it off. We're not ever going to turn our sprinkler system on or bless our plants from the top at 5 o'clock p.m. during the summer. That just keeps those leaves wet, and then you're asking for, for issues down the road, okay? Um, watch early and often. Staying ahead is a huge thing with me. If you come to me, this doesn't look quite right. What's going on? We can correct a lot of problems really easily if you let it sit till July and then bring the sample in. Like, okay, this is infested. What do I do? It's not that we can't control it or fix it, but what damage is done, it's done for the year. So if we can stay ahead and, and kind of be proactive, you're going to have much better luck. I don't know if you've ever heard the term, a lot of people in our trade use the term IPM, you know, Integrated Pest Management, and it's probably avoiding having to go to really harsh systemic heavy duty chemicals because I use something natural and I'm proactive and I stay ahead of the problem in the first place and I don't have to go to the, the real hard ones. So this time of year, watch in spring weather and plan accordingly. You know, there's nothing we can do about what rain we get, what cold we get, on and on. But I can plan ahead knowing that it's wet, knowing that I got a dry day coming up, I can get some things protected. Um, you're not going to have much luck spraying on a wet day, so we have to make sure we, we find those few days that are dry that we can get ahead of the problem a little bit. Uh, choosing the right spray, you know, that's what hopefully us at Sunnyside are here to help you with. You know, get the right product, show you some options. You know, I'm an organic guy. It doesn't mean I'm going to stand here in the pulpit and tell you this is what you're going to do and the only way you're going to do it 
some people make different choices so you know, the choices are out there it's up to you for your own garden to make the right one um, but we do focus a lot on on natural organic things as well um, look learn good spray techniques you know that's huge you could spend all your time and money and get the right thing and do it at the wrong time or do it the wrong way and not have that spray be effective you can be the most organic thing on earth and if you don't use it the right way it's not going to do much good for you so um, choosing the right way to spray we want to cover leaves thoroughly not the quick mist and we bless it we got to get up in there and cover underneath we got to get the top we got to get a really good thorough spray on there that doesn't mean we waterfall it so it's running all over and we're wasting our money and time but we just want to make sure we get as much coverage as we can so that it, it works well um, one big thing with me this time of year a lot of people are pruning you know make sure you clean your pruners if you're sure and sure at all that you might have an issue with this tree or that shrub or this plant we don't ever want to prune something and then move to another healthy plant and prune it if i have a bacterial infection or something in the wood that's an easiest way to transfer that plant from that maple to this maple to that maple and on we go through our yard so a lot of that stuff is more physical contact um, always get a good fertilizer you know I kind of half joking I got two young sons we always feed our kids feed our plants if I have a healthy plant and good drainage good soil I feed it properly I prune it properly you are always going to have superior insect and disease resistance naturally without having to do any extra work so keeping them fed keeping them happy is going to be key um, always get a diagnosis you know that's what we're here for a couple people ask for a class I have a picture of this or I can describe that you can you know a lot of times I'll recognize if you tell me verbally but a picture is a thousand words you can email it you can bring it down it's best to email it because I can download the picture blow it up on my screen and look but be careful when you take your pictures not to make them blurry and don't take a picture of a shrub 20 feet away and say what's wrong with this get up right next to it so I can see a close-up um, then I can get you a proper diagnosis um, you'll see what happened in 2022 question mark that is in essence what I've asked myself here all winter what did I have a problem with in the yard what can I stay ahead of what do I want to make sure I clean up underneath that had a problem um, you can ask those questions last year and then okay chances are maybe that insect or that disease comes to visit me again in 2023 what can I do to, to prevent it from happening in the first place okay with insects in particular that last one you know keep in mind adult versus larva versus egg you know these little creatures have been here for billions of years they're gonna be here long after we're gone I hate to say um, and insects multiply very very fast specifically a lot of the ones I'll show you here on the slides so we have to keep in mind just because I see an aphid and I spray once I don't walk away I use my natural spray if I choose that I spray once I go back in 10 days and do it again maybe a third time because that way I know I'm getting adult anything that hatched and also eggs so that I end the problem and not just get rid of adults and then all the eggs catch out two weeks later and I got the same issue again if that makes sense okay <clears throat> so just a couple things on sprays in general now what I would classify these four classes here just to, so we kind of have we're on the same page with words so topical sprays are things I can put on a plant that'll kill by contact but I'm non-systemic I'm not soaking into the leaf I'm not getting in the flower I'm not getting in the fruit the berry those not, not organic things they can be synthetic man-made but certainly options as far as a little heavier duty topical spray what might be the choice systemic is what um, I probably avoid myself there are certain things that are really tempting to try it on um, but that's your your honest pollinator death if I'm using a systemic that by nature soaks in I apply it to the leaves it goes to the leaf the stem the flower the pollen every part of the plant as that goes through the entire system yes it offers by far superior death of insect in particular because now I don't have to repeat spray I put a systemic in I kill adult I kill larvae I kill eggs it's there for a long time but knowing that that's going to be your choice up to you like okay I really don't want to use that on my rose because I'm probably going to get the bee that comes down to visit my flower later that season or the lavender or whatever the plant is okay is that kind of making sense to everybody so there is a choice you know and ultimately it's up to you as a gardener but those are your kind of classes the last one being natural or organic 
I kind of make those two different words because organic is OMRI certified. Companies pay a lot of money to have the little government stamp on there that says I'm 100% certified organic. You're obviously never going to lose with that. But I would say natural to me is as good as organic, my own personal feeling, because just because Bonai doesn't want to pay the government to put a stamp on their neem oil that says organic, we all know that neem oil is organic, so it's not processed any differently. Um, it's probably a little cheaper that way because we don't have to pay for the, the extra label and the certification. But a lot of vast majority of what we have here would be those natural organic type products. If you look up, I brought a few bottles here. This makes it really easy. If I see a beige cap, or you can see the label, how it's got kind of a beige corner on it, that signifies natural here at the store. So if you glance through our little pharmacy department, you can instantly pick out what I'm not going to use that's going to be safe for everything. Okay? If it's purple, that means it does contain chemical, not necessarily systemic, but it does contain chemical. Okay? So weigh your options and go green if you can would always be my advice. You know, I try to get as many people as I can converted to organic lawn food and all kinds of goodies in my classes. But ultimately, again, it's up to you. We're not going to hate you because you decide to, to go to battle with the systemic from time to time. But choose, choose your options and you can weigh wisely. The one thing is, if you're growing anything edible, fruit, berry, vegetable, anything you're going to put in your mouth, your children's mouths, your friends' mouths, don't ever use systemic. Because by nature, again, that's going to get right into the vegetable, the fruit, the berry. You're going to end up eating that stuff. Um, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. So be avoid only use natural stuff for sure with edible gardening. And then the last thing there, again, just pollinator health. We're trying to save the bees. You know, everybody knows <clears throat> there's bee problems all over the world for pollinators. And we try to do all we can to provide a nectar source. Spray is going to be a huge help. If you use natural products, you're not going to harm the bees. The issue is this, don't ever spray anything in bloom. I can always have the safest product on earth. Neem oil would pick your poison of a, of a good natural thing. If I spray it on a plant that's in full bloom and I get it on the bee, you're going to kill the bee just as easily by covering with neem oil as you are by using a systemic. Okay, So we have to pick, the part of it is go the natural way, but also pick the right time. So I'm always going to try to get up and spray really early when the bees are not active in my garden or really late in the day when the bees have kind of gone to bed for the night sweet get out there and get your spraying done and I won't worry about getting it on the bees that doesn't mean I use systemic and that happens because it's going to be in the plant but if I use natural things like neem oil, spinosad, anything else they'll all harm insects period if I get them physically on it but that's the key is trying to find that timing and that place where you don't get it on the bees Yes. So you're talking about even the systemic that you just put in the, on the soil? Oh yeah, yeah, soil. Okay. So, if, well let's just do this because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on systemics and I brought a couple things up here. You can see um, tree shrub systemic and our rose systemic. This is probably the last year I'm going to carry metacloprid and that's rose systemic and that's at the top of that neonic kind of bee danger thing. Now I talked to a lot of people about this. I was doing a talk at the Rody Society for instance this winter on rhododendrons and we got into half an argument because they use a lot of imidacloprid and these are good gardeners that care about pollinators but they feel strongly that because they do it right after the rhododendron blooms it soaks into the plant they take care of their bug issues and by the time the next year comes around that flower opens they don't have any residual of that imidacloprid. Now I might disagree to some extent because I think you're still taking a chance but that's something they feel comfortable with as an example. As an example for us, on the other side there, you'll see that tree shrub systemic, that same thing, imidacloprid. I would never pour that on a blooming plant because I think, again, you're going to get all that into the flower, the pollen, the rest of it. But let's say I have a birch tree or a beech tree, something that's very prone to insects. Those are about the only two trees off the top of my head that I feel really comfortable. Like, you know what? You're not going to get a 50-foot sprayer to spray your birch tree for aphids every year. Let's put that down in February, let that go through the tree to protect it because that is not a tree that's going to be visited by bees, if that makes sense. So birch and beech are wind pollinated, not pollinated by insects. So that might be a little bit of an exception. If you're still using systemic, you still got to be really careful, but I would rather have you use a root pour if you're going to go that direction versus spray because I can focus on one tree apply that through a watering can, have that go through that one single birch tree, 
and I'm and I'm feeling a little better about that. If I spray it, you can't see it, but that spray is volatizing. It's going to get on all the other plants that are around that tree before before you're done. Okay, is that kind of making sense? So just be careful when you choose. Now, if we look at some different types of insects here, we're going to whip through and show you, you know, kind of some different common things I see people bring samples in, um, and of diseases and insects. So if we talk you know kind of sucking insects these are the guys that are going to attach themselves to your leaves extract sugar their food and then leave you insect poop which we call frass which is a funny word for insect poop but you can always tell sometimes when you see the dropping sometimes you see that sugar glaze on a leaf if you look real close you probably got an aphid on the foliage above it just sitting there sucking sugar and dropping his excrement on the next leaf for you You'll see a slide coming up and we'll show you what happens on that. But aphids are always going to get the new leaves and they're going to cause that stifling, that contortion. Sometimes you can kind of pull it open and go, oh yeah, I see you in there. And it could be all kinds of different colors on aphids. But that's one's pretty easy to take care of. You know, I can just get a simple insecticidal soap. I get neem oil. I can get a whole, almost anything we have in the store is going to take care of aphids. So that's a, that's a pretty easy one to get. But one to watch early. You know, I watch this in my yard. I'm not immune to anything like any of you. Aphids get on all kinds of plants in spring when we get new growth out. White flies is one I have a little battle with in my front. Um, white flies are easy because they're like aphids, really small. But if I touch the plant, you're going to see the little f white flecks of dust that kind of pop up out of that plant. You know, oh, I got some white fly there. They're mobile, which makes them moving from plant to plant a little more than an aphid. But I can get that sprayed again early and I can get rid of the problem instead of letting them get a foothold. For some reason they love my boxwood out in front of my house. They're on there every single winter so I've already went out, shook them off, flooded some in the ground with some water and I'll watch them here in another month to make sure they're gone for the year and I don't have them sucking on my, my nice boxwood out front. Uh, mites will be a little later but I always think we should put these in. I think this is one of the harder ones myself to take care of because they're so small. If we got a white piece of paper and you brought me a leaf, you'd see me went like, what is he doing? I put a piece of paper down and I kind of brush the leaf and I sat there and stare at it. Sometimes with a magnifying glass, they're like little specks of dust that are going to move. They're really, really small. To me, you can always tell spider mite or mite damage in general because I'll see real fine webbing. It looks almost silver. Sometimes you can't see them on there very well, but you'll go, okay, that leaf, excuse me, just doesn't look quite right. <clears throat> then we do the test and see if we have mites, and then again, get that sprayed very, very quickly. If we have chewing insects, now these are things that are probably going to either take a bite out of your foliage and you'll really see them, or they're going to hide in the foliage where you cannot see them. I always put leaf miner on here. I get it on my lilac probably every other year or so. They get on birch trees a little bit. If I see a perfectly green leaf with just a weird brown patch on it, top and bottom, you can actually peel that open and you'll find the little leaf miner larva in there wiggling around. Those are kind of gross. I've found a few of them. But that's one that we can, it's tougher to get because again, he's in the leaf. So 20 years ago, you had no option but buying systemic because I had to soak it into the leaf so that he would extract it, get the poison and kill the bug inside. I can't put a topical spray on something that I can't get to, if that makes sense. So now we have other natural options. You would want to get like spinosad or spinosad, some people call it. We have it in Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. That's a good name for a nice organic a type insecticide. That would take care of leaf miners for you. Leaf rollers and caterpillars, same exact solution. If I've got a leaf roller, I'm going to roll up in the foliage and kind of hide. You can find them out there. Um, and caterpillars are pretty easy to see. You're going to see that nest at some point. Hopefully you'll get them before they get to a big nest. And these are totally cyclical to me. I don't, I should write it on my calendar because I know 10 caterpillars up here are about a seven year cycle. So you'll see no caterpillars, no caterpillars. All of a sudden you'll see a bunch. The next year, wham, anywhere you drive, an entire county here is going to have a 10 caterpillar nest in it. And then they're gone again for a few years and then here we go again with another cycle so watch early you can see those tents if you see them in the native areas that's when i tend to start watching my yard just to make sure one hasn't crawled up and decided to get into one of my plants if you live by a green belt again no chemical necessary this is one of the easiest things 
to spray for to me. Caterpillars, you get BT. It's a bacillus bacteria that I can spray on. Parks use it, cities use it, the state uses it, everybody uses BT. Totally safe, a totally organic insecticide for all those little creepy crawly caterpillars of all kinds. Now, clinging insects sometimes are a little tougher. So anybody got birch trees in here? We got a birch? You know, and that's one, you know, we struggle with a little bit around here on birch. Most of the Himalayan white birch um, get bronze birch borer at some point. Uh, there are resistant birches now that we try to sell uh, for the most part to try to keep that out of it. But this is another one up until recently, you were really stuck with having to hire somebody bring a syringe over and eject your tree with murder, death, kill because he's below the bark. You can see the pinholes there. She lays the arm in there, they get into the bark, they're like little rolls, almost like a little woodpecker has packed rows of holes on there. Then they sit there and tunnel underneath the bark until they eat all the cambium. You've got no circulation and the tree will die. I see a lot of birch in particular around an old birch tree, two thirds of it looks great. One huge branch has no foliage on it. I can almost guarantee if we go look at that branch or the trunk there, the borers have cut off that area. We gotta lop that off there and get that tree treated to cure it. Yes? So anytime you see those holes, it's... It's, it's borer of some kind. And there's borer for birds. There's borer for peach trees. There's borer for lilac. There's a borer for pretty much so every shrub. Well, it could be woodpecker, and that's what I'm saying, is you gotta kinda of figure out your situation. Those are the only two reasons I would really see those How rows of holes. How would you tell the difference? What's that? How would you tell the difference? It's tough sometimes, but typically borers are not necessary. They're usually more in rows when we see a woodpecker. He's going right across in a straight row where borers are probably a little bit more random. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a yeah. Do you have that in a cedar tree also? Because I've been trying to figure it out. No, not, not so much on, uh, well, not to say you couldn't, I would be shocked if it was a cedar. It's probably a little different on that one. Yeah, yeah. Take a little picture. You can always have, sometimes with issues on big trees like that, it's impossible for you to bring the tree down here to look at. You know, picture may help, but sometimes you're going to have to hire an arborist or somebody certified that can come out to your house and look at that specific plant on site to make the right diagnosis too. Okay? A couple more clingers. Mealy bugs is a really tough one. I don't see these a lot outside. They're really hard to get rid of. This is probably, to me, one of the harder ones to eradicate. Uh, they're really disgusting, kind of like cottony mush. I tend to see them. I bring, always put this on here because you could get them on some things outside. I see them in grasses once in a while, other plants. It's a huge houseplant issue to me. You get inside, you're going to have to really inspect your houseplants. You do not want to get mealy bugs started. They will take over everything. And they're always hiding down in the crotch and the little right above the soil, somewhere that's really hard for them to find. We use rubbing alcohol here, to be honest, in a swab, and a lot of times we clean all our plants when they're delivered, when we try to make sure there's nothing in there to make sure we get those mealies out. Uh, scales is another tough one, kind of like barnacles. If you think barnacle, <coughs> what happens? The scale attaches itself to my wood and he doesn't move. It's like a barnacle or limpet for eight months, nine months a year, then they only crawl from like April, May, June, and then they lay their eggs and then reset themselves for the next year. So you can spray them with a lot of things when they're crawling, they're a little softer. Once I have a barnacle on there, again, what's going to get through that hard shell and kill what's underneath? To me, scale, without going systemic again, the way to go is use a good dormant spray. All your plants should have a good dormant spray if you're in, if you're in doubt. And we'll use something like horticultural oil. If I apply that on a bare branch tree, that covers everything, bud, crotch, stem. You cut off oxygen so between the air and that little bug sitting on there all winter, then you're going to win doing it that way too because it's really hard sometimes to get scales in the growing season. We can always walk out with our fingernail and pluck them off, which is kind of a labor of love if you find a few. But I think the oil is the way to go on, on scale. Can you, the scale, are they just on um, uh, twigs? Twigs yeah. usually, they're sometimes in the are season they're hard leaves? to see. Are they ever on leaves? They can be, but typically they're gonna when they're when they're crawling, they can be anywhere. But when they're stuck, they're on they're on wood. Yeah, they're 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 stuck on wood. And there's all kinds of different scales again for different plants. Now a couple that have really been up here lately and don't belong here. Um, Japanese beetle can get on just about anything. Um, they'll defoliate a plant fairly quickly. 
There's a lot of good sprays for Japanese beetle. Again, 10, 12, 15 years ago, it was all systemic. I can use Spinosad, some different products, not do it the natural way and really take care of the beetles. It's not as much of an issue as it used to be, but that's another one. If we stay ahead, think we had a diagnosis for that, get the spray on early and then we don't even have the problem. Um, I've got a personal battle going with Mr. Viburnum beetle. Anybody got snowball bush or any kind of viburnum? They'll eat that thing to the ground. It's been about five years in a row now in Washington. They were never here until then. Um, they defoliated my 12-foot cranberry bush in three days last year because I didn't notice them in time the year before I got them. Um, but this is one we have to get ahead on. These are going to be out by April. <coughs> I use that Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew spray for mine. If I get it on there early when the foliage is emerging, let the thing bloom. Don't ever spray and bloom again. That doesn't change. Let it bloom. Once I had petal drop, I'd get it again. The viburnum beetle tends to hang out in the surface soil in the winter time when stay nice and warm and protected, and then up he comes again in spring. So that would be a plant if you had that issue. Get your leaves off the ground, get them raked up, get that area cleaned, and then we start the season off and hopefully can, can get ahead of it. Because that is one. Like literally, I park right in front of my cranberry bush, one of my favorite plants in my yard. It's a big, huge orange fruit, and it would look perfect. I watched it last year, thought I watched it. Three days later, I drove home and was like, I think there's some leaves gone. Walked over, and it was just gone. I mean, literally gone. No, not one leaf left on it. So they'll usually leaf back out, although I talked to one lady yesterday who came to the class on the wrong day, and she thought, well, yeah, they ate it, and then it leafed out, so I thought it was fine, and they ate it again. So you've you got to get it sprayed if you want to keep it. I have seen more samples of that, especially with snowball bush around here in the last three years than anything, period. So that's one to watch for. This is probably a close number two, lace bug. Anybody recognize the look of those rhodia azalea leaves in their yard? Um, I see this all over the place right now. I've been lucky I'm knocking on real wood behind me that I have not gotten lace bug because I think every roadie in Azalea, there's nothing immune to lace bug. Um, they have really taken over, I think, with a little bit warmer winters around here. Um, you, your roadie is going to look strange, and it can be on not just these, but a lot of evergreens, period. My neighbor's Pieris is covered with it. It's been that way for years. I keep telling her to treat it. She doesn't. So that's another reason I watch my yard because eventually it probably hops in my yard across the street. So. So there's a lot of plants this can get on, and it's going to cause a lot of defoliation. If I see that, you can kind of see that light green, dark green, almost variegated roadie leaf. That's the top. You can tell you right when you look at the plant that that's, that's what's happening. I turn it over, look at the bottom, I'm going to find those little black kind of tar spots all over the bottom of the leaf. In the spring, I would actually see the little larva, like on the azalea leaf, they're crawling around and doing the damage. So this is one you've got to get on early. I've used neem oil, uh, you can use spinosad. The problem a lot of times if you think you had it, I would immediately go home and get neem oil on it here in the next couple weeks because if I can get up in that roadie or azalea, cover all the leaf surfaces, again I'm going to knock off oxygen and I'll probably get ahead a little bit. Debris gets cleaned up for sure. And I would, if you think you might have this, I would make sure to get some of that spinosad or spinosad and get that on that plan in April so we can hopefully get the larva before they get started, okay? A couple others I see a lot of people bring in. We've got Azalea Sawflies. Anyone kind of been seeing that? I didn't see as much last year, but the years previous a lot. If I have a deciduous Azalea only, deciduous Azaleas only, like Exbury types, you know, your orange flowers, yellows, a lot of ones out here, if I walk out, it leaves out, and I go back and look at it, and all I'm left with is the midrib, that hard part of the leaf, and all the tissue's gone, it's typically soft fly. She's flying around here in April, laying her larva on all of our deciduous azaleas. After they leaf out, they'll eat the entire leaf, pupate, and off they go to the next neighbor's house. So these are mobile. They're easy to take care of. Again, not something that usually kills the plant, but... I would like to see leaves on my azalea in the middle of summer and not that, so we need to get that sprayed for if we want to get ahead. Um, I think these are both examples that are kind of hard to catch because that is one example of something that just flies in randomly, lays its eggs, does its damage, and hits the road. You may not even notice. 
Apple Maggot would be another great one to me. Anybody have Apple Maggot been fighting that? You know, that's a really tough one because again, it's edible. I don't use ever systemics on edible or I'm, that's the only way I'm gonna kill. Once that fly has landed on my apple, injected that larva that tunnels to the middle and ruins my fruit, I'm stuck. I can't do anything to correct the problem. I'm done for the year. I got no edible apples at all. So you have to catch the fly before she even gets there. So I brought sticky traps up here. We call them apple pantyhose. If you really love your apple, you'll go out and tie the little maggot socks on your fruit. That keeps the flies from getting at them. Uh, there's a lot of cures for it, but it's going to be something organic again that you just have to put in a little bit of time to catch them. Um, I swear by the pheromone traps. I'm going to try these sticky traps. We got these brand new this year. They'll be a little easier to use, I think. The other option is you buy our little sticky trap kit and it's got the red plastic apples. We smear a biodegradable sticky glue on there and the pheromone goes inside. So when she flies in our yard, she says, ooh, that smells good over there. She goes to your fake apple, she gets stuck. And yes, she'll walk out and go, that's disgusting as you have to paper towel wipe off 100 dead bugs and put more glue on, but you'll keep catching the flies that way and not let them get to the fruit, okay? Some stuff in the ground. Root weevil is probably the number one sample I get of any plant period. All of us have roadies for one reason, and yes, they get on viburnum and laurel and other broadleaf stuff, but more people bring in samples, what's wrong with my roadie leaf, than anything, period. And this goes on for the 30 years I've been doing this. If I have a bite mark at the edge of the leaf, it's always going to be root weevil. I don't even need to tell you. If you came to me and said, I got this leaf and there's like little notches out the side sweet. You'll get, you get a root weevil, I can guarantee you. It's just that common. Um, the way, the hard part with this again is, this is the roadie society. We had this discussion. They want to use systemic because then they have it in the leaf. Systemics are held around the edge of the foliage. The root weevil bites. You kill it, you're done. So I'll leave that up to you. I would prefer you treat the soil to try to get the larva out of there. They live in the soil, crawl up at night, bite away, have dinner, lunch, breakfast all in one, and then they're back in before the sun comes up. So you're never going to catch them. We can't spray them with the topical spray. If you want to go out with the flashlight at 2 o'clock in the morning, you can probably find them. They're really cool bugs, actually. That's about the only way you're going to get them. So our choices are systemic, which I would try to avoid. So we would get something like eight. That's the number eight, and it's written out like eight. And that's a that's a non-systemic, it's, it's synthetic, it's not organic. But I feel a little better about people taking that home because I can broadcast that on my soil on a rainy day. It washes right in the ground and I kill the larva. I don't have to worry about spraying the plant. It doesn't go through the root system. It's just going to eliminate bad stuff on the ground. Do you have that product up here? I don't, I, you know what, it's the only thing I didn't bring in. But you're gonna see this shaker jug Red label just says eight. We got a, we sell a whole bunch of it in there. It's really cheap too for a root weevil. One of the cans literally does 1,500 square feet. So you got old roadies like me in your yard. You're gonna get a whole lot of plants with one can. It's really really easy to do. Yes. How come you didn't mention tanglefoot? Well, and that's the other. It is the last. Is tanglefoot would kind of be like our sticky trap. So we would get a barrier, insect barrier. If you've got a clean rhododendron like mine, this is what I do to mine the front is I've got clean trunks, I could literally wrap those five or six trunks with the insect barrier, <coughs> smear tangle foot or my biodegradable sticky glue on there, and then he crawls up at night, gets stuck in the tape, and you're gonna catch him. You can do it that I way too. Duct tape and duct tape's tape fine. Off. It just took care of the complete problem. Oh yeah, yeah, you get it. you can catch them all that way. And there there are you know I think bugs are pretty cool anyway, but that is a pretty cool bug. That's a pretty specialized little bug, and they're kind of fun when you catch them. But, but uh, that's another option too. We still have Tanglefoot. Uh, we get the insect guard barrier. That's another option if you want to wrap. Sometimes it's really hard on an azalea or a dwarf rhododendron. You're not going to be able to get every single trunk wrapped, but typical large landscape rhododendron is very easy to use that insect barrier. Okay, some other in-ground ones. Crane fly, you know, this is the time I'll do lawn class here in just a couple weeks. Um, I'm the OCD lawn guy. Uh, crane fly has been in my yard a little bit. You're gonna see, it looks like a, you know, kind of a daddy long legs meets, meets a mosquito. You know, in the early spring and the fall, 
she's skimming across the grass in the evening and literally laying eggs all over the place those tunnel into the ground and that eats your root system so if you have huge brown patches of dead grass we take a square shovel we dig a chunk up we lay it over real carefully and we take our gloves and we look through there you're gonna find those larvae in there and then you know I got crane fly I got to do something about it so um, it's the only way you're gonna be able to tell you can't bring me a picture of brown grass and say do I have crane fly I don't know you tell me you got to go home and look at it um, it could be other issues when we have brown grass but crane fly by far the most common uh, insect we see in turf areas uh, slug and snail is not a bug we obviously know that but I think this class we should always mention slugs and snails we don't have a special class on slugs uh, we all have slugs don't feel alone if we don't have slugs you got snails or you got both so that's Washington with the wet weather the shade uh, we are going to have slugs around here my advice is a don't ever buy anything chemical based you don't need murder death kill metal aldehydes you don't need baits you don't need slime you don't need any of that stuff anymore there's totally natural slug killers we can get diatomaceous earth which is very easy to use you can use that around anything totally safe or I buy iron phosphates what I use right here totally organic listed that's sluggo comes in a bunch of different forms but if I can get that down early I'm going to get the slug if I wait until July that slugs had a chance to lay eggs everywhere and I've got an infestation I'm gonna have a little tougher time getting rid of it so for me I would recommend going out you all know your gardens you know what plants are more slug prone get those protected now you know go out there the first part of March put a rim of slug oil around the hosta after we've cleaned the debris up now the slug can't get in there in the first place and usually slug oil, even in wet rainy weather you get about 30 days before you got to go back and put another rim on it okay now somebody's going to ask me what's the difference between all these different slug baits the only difference is we got iron phosphate, we have diatomaceous earth, and then I have a separate one, I didn't bring it in, that's also actually got spinosad or spinosad in it. So iron phosphate plus that. So if I want to kill more ground insects, I go to the dual action one. If I'm just worried about slugs, the only difference in any of this stuff is the attractant. So if I look at Sluggo Max right here, that will cover like 10 times the amount of area. Most people that buy Sluggo or have been put too much of this down it costs a little bit more than sluggo but I'm telling you for your money you're gonna get a lot more coverage because that has the superior attractant in it it works quite quite well okay I have a question about mm -hmm. sluggo yeah I don't know if anybody has this trouble but uh, when I put it down it disappears overnight is that rabbits eating it or and it's n and the slugs are still there but the sluggo is gone well, I wouldn't think it's rabbit it's not bird that's I mean, a tough, right? Rats, sweet. if anything. Every night I'll put it down and it's all gone the next morning. Yeah, yeah. rats, if anything, rats I would think. I wouldn't think bird for sure. Yeah, because I use it a lot. I got birds all over my yard and I don't have any of that, any bird okay. picking. Yes? What did you say to do for crane fly? So, crane fly is a tough one because I, I'm trying some things at my house because there isn't really a, a natural thing for a crane fly. I've heard people online talk about mission up a dish soap and soaking their lawn. I mean, there's, there's things to try. And I'm gonna try it again this spring. I luckily don't have a lot, I should knock on wood. But if I do see him, I try something. Um, the only thing I have is this red bag here. This is a soil killer. Again, I don't mind this as much using a chemical base because everything else that we've talked about on sprays, I want a dry day. I want it to soak on the leaf and dry on. This is the opposite to me. I want it to rain because I want it out of my sight. It goes into the soil. So if I get crane fly larva killer and broadcast out on my turf on a right before it rains or the day before or whatever uh, it's going to flush into soil and I'm not as worried about my kid my pet me stepping on it and tracking it all over the place I want it in the soil because it's going to eliminate the larva for sure okay so a couple turf diseases um, I fight both these because again I don't use a lot of chemical especially on my turf um, red thread is everywhere. Um, I could probably go to anybody's house right now and probably pluck out a piece of red thread of their yard. That's Washington. Um, if Yes, if it's left unchecked, it may kill patches, get thatch disease. If you look really close, you'll see that red or pink color to it as it's in spore. Um, this is one, 
that typically disappears. I mean, if I don't do anything red thread, and I got a little patch here and there right now in my heart, I won't do anything with it. In two weeks when I throw my first dose of organic lawn food down, the nitrogen causes all that growth and it grows right through and it disappears for the entire summer fall. Yes, I'll probably see a little bit of it again next winter, but it usually gets rid of it doing that way. If I really want to treat, I can use a few different options. The, you know, the easy way again is chemical route is use infuse. I put that in my spreader and I broadcast that on my turf that sits down there and goes to the thatch layer and nukes all the fungus in there. So that would take care of any thatch disease of any kind. If I want to stay natural, neem oil works very well sprayed on lawns. We get that down in spring that would suppress all that from spreading. Um, and the other thing is copper fungicide. That's a natural fungicide, not organic, but as long as I'm not near water, copper is the, I use a lot in my own yard on a lot of different things, and I'm, you're okay as long as you're not right on the water. That would be the one place not to use copper, okay? Yes? Does that red thread often look like rust? Is it, it orangey? Orangey, pinky, reddy. Rust is a different issue on turf. Same solutions we've talked about, but typically it's more pink or pink thread or red thread when it's turf related. The, the hardest part, with the lawn to me, like it, which any of you guys got lawn service? You got somebody come mow your lawn for you, or do you do it yourself? If you do, you know that is part of the problem to me. Is the, the Mr. Whoever, Mr. Jones' lawn service, and he's popping from neighbor to neighbor. Your lawn might be totally clean. Your three doors down is not. And if he mows your lawn, all the spores are on the wheels, the blades, the undercarriage, the entire lawn mower. Now you got it because he comes to your house next. So I would always ask, like, hey. Do you mind like washing your mower and throwing some rubbing alcohol on there to sterilize it? Or if you mow your own lawn, clean your blade, clean your mower. Don't leave it all the time. The chances are if you had something, it moves really easily. I, I always, I'll tell it in my lawn class again, but I mean, I'll tell a story for me. I'm a golfer. So I go out golfing a few years ago and I come home. I saw something in my side yard, so I stepped out of my truck, still had my shoes on. Walked across my lawn, went over, checked it, came back in, took my shoes off, went away. A week later, I'm like, what the heck? You could follow my footprints, red thread, red thread, red thread, right across my entire lawn where I walk. So this is on your shoes, it blows in the wind, I mean, it's everywhere. So if you want to get ahead, the fertilizer will always fix it. I'll be brutally, I mean, I, if it was me, I'm not going to do a thing about it. When I put my food down, green comes up, lawn looks good as new, and off we go for another season. But if you really want to keep it red fred three, we kind of got to do one of those other things on there. And same same thing with dollar spot. Rose diseases, I, I'll just touch on these. We did a lot of these at Rose class, but you know we got our mildews, we got our black spot, we got our rust, we got virus, we got different things. Um, you know my advice with that is, you know everybody likes the. I love roses. I got roses in my yard. We're in Washington, and unless we have a Rugosa rose or a species shrub rose, you're going to get black spot and mildew. With the weather cycle we have up here, if you do not spray, you're going to get it eventually. The, the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to live with it? Or do we want to be proactive? If we spray early and we feed them and we do all the things we've talked about today, I'm going to have great roses and I can live with a little bit of black spot here and there kind of thing. If you really want to keep them clean, i got to get on a spray maintenance. And this is where you got to make a choice. Systemic drench, not so good for the bees. Spray with the systemic, not so good for the bees. Or I get Rose RX neem oil, which does everything. Disease, bugs, all the above. But I have to spray more often. So maybe I'm on my neem oil like every couple weeks in the springtime as the new leaves are coming out so I can stay disease free. If you walk away from your rose till June, and then you bring me a branch that's covered in black spot mildew and say fix it, it's, it's going to be a tough ask. Yes, we can control it. We can keep it from getting worse. We can cut it back. The new leaves will be clean. We can spray those. But you're not going to, you got it for the year, I hate to tell you. So if we can get on there early, we can keep it from coming on in the first place. Okay? When's early? Uh, early would be as soon as we got leaves. And you're probably there now or the next couple weeks. I, I always have President's Day marked on my calendar. I want my first dose of fertilizer going down. I want to strip my plant, get all the leaves clean. That's a perfect plant to have nothing on the ground in the winter time. I don't want any old rose leaves as compost. We want that gone away to the city waste, 
You guys heat it up, compost it, kill it. We'll buy it back as compost later kind of thing, okay? A uh, couple fruit things, apple scab. Um, sometimes looks like maggot because we have those little spots on there. But if I slice an apple scab, it's A, it's going to be on the leaves as well as the fruit. But if I slice that apple in half and look at it, the flesh is perfect, the taste is perfect, the quality is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. I can peel that and still use it for sauce or pies and eat it, whatever I want. It's not going to hurt anything, but it looks brutal. You know, I get scab on apple, you're like, I'm not going to even touch that thing. They're still usable, but I need to treat that early. I got to get that on there now after they bloom, get my spray on. We carry a wonderful home orchard spray for all fruit in the season. This is natural sulfur, natural pyrethrin that does bug and disease. If I get on a spray schedule with that here and keep my plant from getting scab and I make it till summer and the weather warms, I'm good to go for the year. So this isn't something I have to do for nine months, but a couple months here in this key time frame. Same exact thing with leaf curl. If you, anybody got peach, apricot, nectarine, all the above. Again, with our wet springs, chances are you're going to get leaf curl. The superior product for leaf curl is always going to be copper fungicide. You've got to get that spray on there. Again, never in bloom. Right now you're at the cusp where maybe you can still sneak in that late winter dormant spray before they bloom. Let the petals do their thing. Let the bees pollinate it for you. All the petals hit the ground. Let your fruit get just a little bit of size to it and the leaves are all out, then wham, we go right back and spray it again to make sure we, we stop it, okay? Pears, same exact thing. If I'm growing pears and I have black foliage, that's the one I worry about. That's blight and that will get on the fruit and rot my crop of pears. So I'll have black leaves, I'll have twig die back, I've got to really spray, I've got to prune, I've got to do some extra work with pear blight. Pear rust probably looks worse because we look at those leaves and you're like oh that looks like the plague it's got big orange pustules on it and all kinds of deformity doesn't typically get on the fruit so I can still use the fruit here with rust is a lot of diseases have two hosts so in our neck of the woods it's western red cedar every western red cedar around here has pear rust in it doesn't affect the cedar the springtime the wind the rain blows out gets back on my pear tree again so I'm never going to tell you, oh, go home and cut every cedar down in your neighborhood. That's not going to work. But that's how, why we have it. So if I have cedar and pear, I'm going to really watch for that rust and try to keep it from getting on there in the first place because it will come from the green belt, the neighbor's house, wherever that does have it. Okay. Uh, blueberries. You know, the main one I see around here for blueberry disease is mummy berry. And that's a tough one to get rid of to be honest with you. I really got to do some pruning, some thinning, clean up debris is a huge part of mummy berry. But if I have my berry cluster look like it's going to ripen and they literally shrivel and look mummified, they turn gray, white, and you got mummy berry. Sometimes it's get that plant out of here because you don't want that to get on the rest of your blueberry patch. There are some varieties that are very resistant or even immune. Other ones are very susceptible. So pick your variety wisely. Um, and watch for that. I'm not saying everybody's going to get mummy berry. It's not a huge issue, but I do see samples of that come in. That's the most common blueberry uh, issue that I see up here at least. That one I don't have any cure for on the natural side. If I've got mummy berry, we would clean up, we would prune, get rid of old wood, get all the debris out, mulch it very heavily will help, but we're going to have to spray with something like funginil. That's a chemical fungicide, non-systemic, and it's safe to use on edible things, but it is still a chemical, it's not organic. On the right there, raspberry, you know, I wrote root rot, um, I could have called this 12 different names, but if I'm growing raspberry and I've got problems on the disease end, canes that open up in spring and just shrivel and die, or random patches are dying out, it goes to drainage. It's too wet there where we're growing our raspberries, then we get root rot, anthracnose, there's a number of different issues that can infect a raspberry patch. Um, the only way to tell is again, watch them in spring, see if you see a random piece here and there that shrivel or some that don't leaf out um, and look really closely at the wood because we're going to see purple or black or some different spots or color on that cane itself that's going to give us the clue to which one it is. Blossom blight on cherry. 
see it every year up here whether I have ornamental cherry ornamental plum or fruiting cherries and plums anything in that prunus family is going to be susceptible to a little bit of blossom blight um, that's something again that blows around the wind and the rain you could do all you can to be ready to go for spring your neighbor's got a ratty flowering cherry that she does nothing with and it blows onto your tree you got it right back again the next year I mean that's just the honest truth if I've got blossom blight your flowers look like they open and you're like wait a minute that was only a day or two before they turn brown and shrivel or if I had a fruiting cherry maybe it blooms and I get a little tiny cherry on there and they drop or they rot and you get no no fruit development those are real common one up here um, especially in the ornamental flowering cherries and flowering plums not crab apple not other things just mainly those two <clears throat> um, the biggest thing with that is again I've got to spray if you're going to control blossom blight I get copper fungicide or a bio fungicide if you want to go natural I probably got to do some pruning I want to cut out dead wood I want to cut down anything that's shriveled it'll grow right back I see it every year in, in my neighborhood I see it at the nursery once in a while one branch shrivels and turns brown we follow it up to where we have green leaves we skip one bud prune there and then in the summer it grows right back down and you got healthy wood again so it's not gonna kill your tree in a year but if I walk away you're gonna look at your tree in a couple years and go I can see leaves here and there but I got all kinds of dead wood in the middle and that thing is not blooming anymore it's because we're fighting blossom blight same with dogwood and thracnose who's got dogwoods so dogwoods one of my favorite flowering trees I got a big one in my yard when I chose mine this is the right plant in the right place discussion choose a disease resistant variety to start with don't buy American dogwood get Korean or get a hybrid dogwood same flower same great tree but you're gonna have natural resistance built in there buying a, a healthier tree American dogwood Tennessee Appalachia other side of the country where they have drier springs are gonna be much better than over here okay um, 20 years ago I was carrying probably 200 American dogwoods and 20 Korean dogwoods this year I might have 30 total American dogwoods and I got about 400 Korean ones so that should tell you what we're trying to sell people a little healthier tree that's easier to grow you're always gonna see that shriveled tip on the leaf and you'll notice it if you have a dogwood tree and this could be shrub tree and thracnose is a specific issue on a lot of plants very very specific <coughs> with the dogwood I'm always gonna see the tip shrivel and if I don't do anything about it it's gonna get into the wood and it's gonna kill my flower bud so a lot of times you have a dogwood you come to me and say it hardly bloomed this year what's wrong we do some asking some questions and oh yeah you've had a thracnose for a couple years we got to get that thing pruned out fed and sprayed and off it goes to for another life you know we'll get it back into life okay vegetables just a couple for later um, you know right now um, tomato blight I'm not thinking about tomatoes I hope none of you are quite yet uh, tomatoes the number one thing to me is um, don't put this stuff out too early that's the biggest mistake I think with gardeners in our area you get the spring itch you want to get the garden going you're like it's mid-April it's time to put the zucchini and the squash and the pumpkins and all these warm weather vegetables in this is what's gonna happen if you do it early you're gonna get blight on it unless you've got umbrellas to keep them dry or a little greenhouse to keep them dry my neighbor does and she starts them early and they're fabulous but she has a lot of precautions built in to keep them dry we can't have cool nights wet weather with a lot of this stuff so you're gonna get blight you're gonna get mildew if you start them early I don't put my tomatoes out till June 1st sometimes I break the rule and go late late May but I would really try to talk you into waiting as long as you can because the temperature is going to be warmer the nights are going to be warmer and you're not going to have to deal with this quite as much okay rhododendrons two things there powdery mildew so you can see the top of the leaf and the bottom if you have a rhododendron it's defoliating and you're seeing spotting on it if I have rhododendron mildew I can see that pattern on top and if I flip it over you're going to see those grayish beigeous kind of patches on there that's the telltale sign I got rhododendron mildew it looks totally different than mildew on a rose is it the plague no is my gonna kill my plant no but typically if you have this 
you're going to look at your roadie and you've probably got one beautiful healthy set of green leaves on the outside and everything in the middle is continually dropping because it's got the mildew in it. So we have to break the cycle with both of these and that would mean a good spray, a good cleanup, and then in spring our rhododendron blooms, all that beautiful healthy new growth comes up. I've got to get that new growth sprayed so that it doesn't continue the cycle for the next year and the next year after that. So if we can kind of break the cycle with those two, uh, very easy. So when? when well, it depends on when your roadie blooms. You know, it could be later March, it could be later April, it could be later May. Um, clean it up as soon as you can. The old leaves need to go out of there. That's phase one. But for protecting my new growth, that's going to be after bloom. We either prune it back after it's flowering, then spray it when the new leaves come up, or let the flower age, new growth replaces it, and then we can spray that. So spray after bloom. After never spray and bloom again. Nothing ever, ever. You're going to get the bees. So after bloom, we need to protect that the new foliage for the season. There's our sooty mold. So we talked earlier about aphids and sucking insects. The camellia is one that I, this is from my yard a few years ago. <coughs> if I'm an aphid and I suck that sugar, I drop my sugar on the leaf below and I get that glazed donut look. What's gonna grow on sugar? Mold, I'm gonna get black sooty mold. So that's a great example of a problem that's twofold. A, I had insects in there creating the sugar. Now I got mold growing on the sugar. So these will all defoliate, they'll drop all these leaves if we don't do anything about it. I can grab my thumb and wipe that black right off of there. You know, it's something I can wipe off, it's not on the leaf. But I would spray that with a combination spray where I can kill the bug and the disease. So something like neem oil works for both. I can even use, honestly, the fruit. I've got pyrethrin would kill the bug and I would also uh, control the mildew or the, the sooty mold with the sulfur in there. There's some options with that on the natural side. I put leaf gall in there. <coughs> I've had it a couple times over the years. It looks very strange. Um, if you've seen that on your azaleas, typically you'll walk out April, May, June and see a little spot of that here and there. I usually just prune it out, throw it in the yard waste, new leaves replace it, and I'm done. I don't have to worry about it continuing. If you're going to spray for leaf gall, we would go for copper. That would be the superior natural fungicide would be copper fungicide. A couple conifers. Typically I like to tell people to try to attack conifer issues in the fall because a lot of this again is wind, rain blown that gets in these and tends to show up in September, October, November. We can fix the problem so we don't have it again that next spring. Um, always look at your needles when they drop. If I have an old pine tree and I look at the base and look at some of those needles that have dropped out of the center, look for striping or spotting on those needles and that's going to tell you maybe I have needle cast or an issue that I should probably get sprayed for so I don't end up losing a chunk or the majority of my, of my conifer specimen. In the spring we would see tip blights. Mainly up here I see it on spruce. I've got a perfectly healthy tree with nothing wrong with it. The new growth comes up and it turns brown and folds over all over the tree. Maybe some of you have seen that around, um, usually on spruce, could be on others. But that's one, again, we would want to prune out and make sure that we don't have it continue uh, for the next season. Maples always comes down to drainage. Anybody got Japanese maples like me, I'll raise both my hands. Um, this is a really tough one and it's personal with me. Um, I can tell you the first one, anyone know that word, verticillium wilt. So that's a problem that everybody has. I could go to any one of your yards, I could go to my yard, I could dig a hole in the ground until I reach groundwater, I could take a sample of that water, have it tested, and I can guarantee you there's verticillium fungi in there at some point. That's just the way how climate is in Washington. It doesn't attack plants until our groundwater table comes up in the winter and we've got bad drainage. Now maple's the poster child. There's a lot of plants that will get nuked by verticillium wilt. On the other end, there's a lot of great plants that are immune to it. So you can look online and see verticillium immune, resistant, susceptible. You can find lists of all those things if you want to play it safe. You know, for me, my wife would probably tell you, but I think I wasted 500 bucks 20 years ago on coral bark maples. I wanted one outside my kitchen window so bad I could taste it. Put one in, two years, dead, knew it was verticillium well. Dig a bigger hole, put more compost in, I'll fix that. Two years, dead again. 
three strikes, I'm done. I went and bought a dogwood tree, which is immune, been beautiful in my yard for 20 years since then. So don't waste your money. Maples are really tough. Japanese maple is the poster child for this and a lot of other plants too. If I have a dead tree in the spring and I've had a maple for years and I walk out and you're like, what's going on? Two thirds of it leafed out, one branch, looks like it tried to and then you lit a match to it, it all shriveled. I can almost guarantee you, you got verticillium wilt. Cutting that branch out is not going to solve the problem. If it's gotten into the wood, the tree's done at some point. There's no cure for verticillium wilt, okay? So be careful where you plant them. Up higher is always better. Drainage is a must, but watch for that. If I, you can see the piece of wood I put on there, if I cut a dead branch off a maple or any other tree that I think has verticillium, A, I'm going to go sterilize my saw so that I don't take that to another plant, and B, I'm going to look at the cross section. I'm going to see that kind of black, dark brown bullseye there in the middle. That tells me every time I've got verticillium in my tissue, okay? The other one there is black. You can see on that piece of coral bark that I've got black on the wood. That is called Pseudomonas. That's a bacterial problem we see. Coral bark is the most susceptible to it. But walk out this time of year before things leaf out and look at your coral bark or plants. You'll see black tips. I can prune them out, I'm done, sweet, I'm, I'm gonna be okay. If I don't do anything that's gonna travel right through the wood, get to my trunk and I'm gonna lose my plant. Now I can spray for Pseudomonas with copper fungicide, that will help. If I had a coral bark, I would be spraying my coral bark with copper every single late winter to hopefully help control this a little bit. Um, again, good air, good sun, good drainage, all that's going to help quite a bit, but just watch for that black. That's never a good color in the, on, the, on the bark, okay? Now the last two here are just kind of for fun. Now, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I'm always here, except never on Wednesdays. Um, I've got some great staff around. Um, we're always happy to help. We love puzzles and mysteries. Sometimes you might bring me something. I love to get challenged, like, ooh, I've never seen that. Give me a couple days, let me do a little digging around, see what I can find out and get you the right answer. But this is why we want you to bring in a sample, a picture, something to help us, because a lot of times it may not have anything to do with this class. There's a lot of cultural issues, lack of fertilizer, things that are gonna make plants look very weird. Frost damage, you know, come spring. A lot of times you'll see leaves get frosted, it looks just like you had aphids sucking sugar out of it if it got too cold too late. So there's a lot of cultural things that might damage plants and that's the reason to bring the sample in so that we can get the right diagnosis. I can fix both of these with a nice easy fertilizer and your plant's gonna look great in a few weeks. You know, we can get iron in, we can add nitrogen, we can add missing elements that are in the soil to fix plants. You know, I got sunburn, I can move it to the shade. You pick the wrong plant in the wrong place, we got sunburn. It's not blight, it's not the plague. It's just a simple cultural thing that we can fix. I can stop overwatering. That's a really common one. I see samples come in here. You're watering it way too much. That's why we're looking like that. So get in the right place with the right care, the right plant. Um, we're going to have happy, happy plants long term. Okay? So that's our, we don't really, you know, if you didn't, you, everybody got the handouts. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, you know, we've always got great information on our website. Um, you can always email. There's our email right there. You can access that through our website as well. But like I said, I love pictures. Sometimes you can describe it to me and I can probably help you out. A lot of times going to say, please send me a picture. I don't want to waste your time. And if you, I don't have the right information, we don't get you the right diagnosis. You're going to buy the wrong product. You're going to waste your time, waste your money and not correct the problem. So if we can get you the right answer, then you can make your choice as far as how you want to do it. Okay. So let's go shut that off. Now, if to, today for the class, uh, today for the class we have um, all the pharmacy on 20% off. So if you need anything to grab, I'd go get your shopping done because I don't ever put. We don't, to be honest, make a lot of money on any of this stuff anyway. And this is the one time a year that we do all the products on 20% off. So load up on neem oil, whatever your favorite thing is. Um, there's some good products in there. It's all 20%. Just let them tell you at the class, including the slug control as well. So everything I have up here plus the rest of the pharmacy, I'm ready to go. 
if I was probably going to mention one last thing here, because I didn't really bring it up, but someone will eventually ask me about it. So if we look at that product right there, okay, this is called Revitalize. I use a lot of this in my yard. So if you're honestly trying to go natural organic, you really don't want to use chemical applications. We talked about anything to do with disease today, not bug. This will take care of it. This is, it sounds like the worst thing up here because the label says biofungicide. That sounds like nuclear, like, oh my, that's probably the worst thing he has on the shelf. That's the best thing on the shelf. If you ever use old stuff like Serenade was an old brand name. Compost tea even was out kind of as an option for a while with all the microbes. All this is, if I open this bottle, it would make me want to eat a molasses cookie because it's literally molasses sugar with a bacillus bacterial solution that eats fungus. So this is not a cure. I want to make this sure this is clear. If you're going to be truly proactive, the vegetable garden, your rose, your lawn, your fruit tree, anything in the landscape, and I want to be proactive. If I start putting this down and get on a regular spray schedule, this will keep me from getting anything in the first place. If I let my rose get covered in black spot mildew and go back and use this, it's not really going to help you to be honest with you. But if this is on my foliage and ready to go as the weather's in the wet spring here and all that, anything flies down there and tries to propagate has no chance. I mean, that's just the honest truth. So this is what I tend to use in my yard for anything period to do that I'm worried about, okay? She wants to get a picture of that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's a great, you know, we've tried, I try a lot of stuff at home. You know, this isn't something me just like, oh, let's sell them that, we can make more money. We're trying to sell you guys success, get you good information, get you the right solution, you know, as a business. So when I'm traveling shows and looking at different products, that's what I'm looking for, something that's okay, this is Serenade on steroids. If you have Serenade, don't throw it away. It doesn't go bad. Um, I still had some, used it up before I went to that, but it's all about concentration. This is way less money than Serenade, and it has 10 times more bacillus in it. So you tell me, which is more economical, that's way, way, way better bang for the buck, you know, trying to use it kind of thing. So, so there's a lot of good <clears throat> natural stuff. You're more than welcome to come up here and ask me about any of it. You're probably going to try to get me to describe something in your yard, and I'll try my best. But you can always, again, go home, send a little picture down, and we can get you fixed that one. Okay? So thanks for coming.